Guys, I always tell myself I should wear contact lenses when I do this. Hey guys, glad to join. I'm gonna just let everybody come up in here. What's up, Courtney? Miss Sarah Stara Stud, Free Enterprises. I see you guys. Marcel, what's up? Hey, hey, can somebody do me a favor? Can somebody type up um, the only good Indians? The only good Indians in all capital letters. And I would do it, but then it's like things gonna knock over. Thank you. Fab is one of my favorite rappers. Um, can you type up the only good Indians in a comment and then put by Stephen Graham Jones, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Graham and Jones, or at least the only good Indians. Um, thank you, because I need, I want to um, put this on, and when I try to type it myself, it's just, it's just messes with the, uh, the live thingy, and if I try to do it, all that posting stuff, I mean pasting, you know what I mean, but I know sometimes people are like, what's the name of the book because it's backward and I'm not gonna keep holding it up because I know people think it's upside down or something like that and my dad was like, it's distracting. So I was like, okay, I won't do that. <laughs> Thank you for the legs compliment. Um, Stephen Graham Jones. Thank you, Virgo, Virgo Carey. I wanna paste that, but the only thing is um, it's, it's spelled incorrectly. I don't wanna spell his name incorrectly with Stephen. With this, um, the only good Indians. Thank you. The end, only good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones, um, and Porter. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. So welcome to the chat, you guys. We need to chat more often too because I know you guys have questions. Um, I know you have questions regarding music and everything like that. I know they do type really fast. Um, yes. Thank you guys. Hey, what's up, Wes? Hindi. <laughs> okay, yes, you can order these books on Amazon. If you guys don't already have The Only Good Indians, you can order it on Amazon. You can go to um, bookshop.org if you want to support a lot of indies. You can also download it from your, go to your app and Apple iBooks or something like that. You can do the ebook. You don't have to have read the book to join our chat. Um, and is Cymatica still coming? Cymatica is going to come one day and I, I take songs off of it because they just don't match anymore. But there are two songs that are that remain because it's not um, it's not a in the moment type of sound. So that's gonna last. But but the next album that I'm working on, um, the, the next album that'll be coming out, the, the new project is going to be the vibe of the first two albums. All right, y'all. All my albums they're available, but there's one that's not available um, because you left. Because um, because I love it. That one's not available in the States, and, you know. But we'll talk about that later. Um, I want to make sure we're good. We're good in here. Um, what's up from the Carolinas? All right, you guys. Before I bring in the author, Mr. Stephen Graham Jones, we're talking about the good Indians, literary horror, horror literary, that blend, that vibe. Um, I... It was horrific. There were parts of it that were really hard for me to read, but we will, we will, we will get to this. Um, but first, I want to bring on the author. Thank you guys for all the love you guys are showing up in here. And if any of you guys are aspiring writers, most people say that they have a story in them, right? We're going to talk about writing tips as well. So stay tuned. All right. I always get to this part, and I'm like, how do I do it? All right. We're going to join Mr. Stephen Graham Jones. He's going to be with us. What's up, Nini? What's up, Meredith? He's going to join us here with that. Um, because he's published with Saga. So there he is. No, you have the no, headphones no. being all official. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me turn up my volume again. I had it down before because it was like way too loud. And we weren't chatting. All right. Okay, guys, we are here with author Stephen Graham Jones. He is a prolific writer and he's written The Only Good Indians, which is one of the buzziest books of the year. I've been seeing it everywhere. And it, yeah, it hits you. <laughs> it hits you where it counts. Do you want to tell everybody what um, 
point. I'm going to stop holding the book because people say it's like looks backward and all that. So we'll do that before. Um, can you tell everybody what it's about? I'd rather them hear it from you than me. Sure. Sure. Oh. Thank, first, thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be here. And I just got a fortune in my fortune cookie that says you're about to embark on a delightful journey. So this is that. Oh. Journey, I think. <laughs> um, awesome. <laughs> The Only Good Indians is four guys are out in the field up on the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana after elk one afternoon before Thanksgiving. And it's the last day of the hunt for them. They think they're not going to get out in the field again. So all rules are off. Anything that fills their freezer is the right thing as far as they're concerned. And they end up committing a trespass, which is a trespass or a crime, not just against the elk, but against their tribe. They're basically taking food off of um, people's plates. They make it through this day. They pretty much make it for 10 years later, for, for 10 years from that point. And they think it's well behind them, but then something starts hunting them. They are possibly gonna have to pay for what they did 10 years ago. Yeah, and they definitely pay for that. <laughs> I mean, it was really, it, I think one of the things that's really cool is that um, I think the scariest horror is when you when you read something that's so grounded in real life. It's almost like um, you're sitting in a real a real setting, a real uh, a realistic story, something that could really happen, and then all of a sudden things start going left. And that to me is scarier than like the scary thing behind the door and all of that. It's like sitting you down in something realistic. And you did such an amazing job of balancing um, social commentary um, with the horror elements. It's like horror and um, real life. You know, I saw something that I came across and I never like to compare people because I always mm -hmm. feel like, it's, you know, artists are artists and they have they do their own mm -hmm. thing. Um, but they were like, it's, it's, it's kind of like what Jordan Peele does with horror and social commentary regarding black people. And it's kind of like what you do and what you've done in The, the Only Good Indians. And mm -hmm. before we even move further, can you please explain like how you would like what you would like me to say is, I know some people like don't like to use Indians, mm -hmm. especially if you're not Native American. Although mm -hmm. I apparently have less than 1% Andes, so I guess it's a little Incan, but that's like less than 1% <laughs> in my ge genetics. Mm -hmm. Still, mm -hmm. I don't obviously don't code indigenous, so mm -hmm. for me, I'm still looking at it from the outside. Mm -hmm. um, what do you prefer to be, to be, to refer to and why? Because I thought I, yeah. yeah, um, you know, I go by, I, I call myself Indian because I grew up Indian. And so to be something different than Indian, to be, um, to be now Native or Indigenous or um, Native American, or uh, used to the term was Amer Indian, you know, back, back mm -hmm. when, which is kind of more of an ethnographic term, I think. It feels weird for me to like mid life become something else. And so years ago, I just figured it's easier just to be Indian. And yeah, not everybody's comfortable with the term. People who say it's an inaccurate term are 100% right. You know, Columbus did not make it to India, he made it to a place that he was not expecting. He mislabeled us Indians. Nevertheless, I grew up Indian, and that's what I think I'm going to remain. I will use native sometimes myself more as an adjective, I guess. But if I am going to use like a, um, compound term i'll usually go with american indian i like american indian because it makes it lets us be at the center at the noun place and america <laughs> becomes a modifier the adjective which is less important and mm -hmm. i like the idea of america being less important mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i can feel that um mm -hmm. yeah i think it's it's interesting because um i think you, i saw somewhere where you're talking about reclaiming some people like to creep uh, reclaim I forget what was the word that you said some people are using it again to reclaim and mm -hmm. saying that it kind of stands for something else what was that let me think um um reclaim reclaim I'm thinking I'm thinking oh yeah some people will say that Indian comes from India which means in God you know right yeah, that's and it, I, yeah. I, li I, li I like that twist on it too although although mm -hmm. you know it's it's a lot of people wouldn't know that yeah. Um, yeah. But I think it's important. It's interesting when we talk about like our identities because mm -hmm. you know, I'm Korean and black. My mm -hmm. mom is South, South Korean and my dad is, is black American. Mm -hmm. And I use, I tend to use just black um, mm -hmm. because for me that encompasses everybody in the diaspora. But at mm -hmm. the same time, like I also really like equally African American, but I didn't mm -hmm. always like African American. Actually, mm -hmm. I kind of like, I bristled against that one because yeah. Yeah. to me, I was like, I'm American, 
everybody mm -hmm. who's American as far as the United States, America, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. is American and from somewhere else, mm -hmm. except for, you know, India's Native Americans. So mm -hmm. I was like, I don't like feeling like I have to hyphenate myself. Mm -hmm. It's almost redundant, right? Mm -hmm. Unless everybody's going to hyphenate, I don't feel like, well, I need to hyphenate. Yeah. However, because I feel like it's easy for black people to, we have so much culture, like all of us have culture, but what's happened to black people is like, oh, we're separated from that. And then now start. And it's mm -hmm. almost as if starting from slavery. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we experience. but we've got thousands and thousands of years before that. Yeah. So to just drop African, it just doesn't really make sense in a big yeah. picture. So yeah. I've come to actually like that. But I think, yeah. I think we have to also respect what everyone wants to be called yeah. on a collective level and an individual level, which is why I wanted to make sure that, you know, we were on the right page with that. For um, sure. For sure. And you know, I'm, the people like native is the term that's kind of in style right now. And it's probably been in style for the last three or four years. And I'm mm -hmm. completely, I'm completely comfortable with native. It, native is actually a really good descriptor. You know, it works, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it works completely well. Yeah. Are we like, is everybody else like interlopers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more or less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone said not all blacks have been oppressed like the African Americans, so mm -hmm. prefer to make that distinction. That's true. But at the same time, I've traveled all over the world. Mm -hmm. I've traveled all over the world. And I, I feel like even if it's not that same oppression that happens in the United States, you still get that. I still see it everywhere in the world anyway. Um, whether it's colorism within communities, like mm -hmm. it still happens. Is there colorism in, in the um, native, uh, yeah. really? Yeah, like I mean, dark, yeah, like yeah if, if you're darker, then it's assumed that you have more blood, you know? Oh, is that a good, is that looked at as a good thing or a bad thing? You know, um, it, it's a, it's a definitely a big issue right now, not, not just right now for the past century and 20 years probably um blood quantum has been a d driving distinguishing factor in who gets federal recognition as indian or not and blood quantum means the government says if you have this much of your percentage you can trace it it's like verifiable then you get to have um, these rights or these tree specific rights or whatever and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the trick is that's it's weird to hand over our power to say who is and is an Indian to the government. It's we should be able to say it ourselves. We should have that sovereignty. And so yeah. it's, compl it's completely arbitrary for the government to say you're in, you're out. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of um, people who say um, I'm this much blood, you're not this much blood, so I'm more Indian than you. When Indian is not actually a matter of degree to me, it's a matter of enculturation. And it's, you know, Gerald Visner, a writer, critic, thinker, he says that um, being Indian is an act of imagination. And that's probably the best definition for it I've heard. Yeah. And it is interesting of wanting to be able to find that for yourself. I know that's the mm -hmm. conversation we have a lot with what's going on with uh, Kamala right now. And, and mm -hmm. it ha mm -hmm. you know, is she really black and not black? And I'm like, you know, you mm -hmm. have the one drop rule. I can understand that because being mm -hmm. biracial, you know, um, people can say, oh, well, you know, that's the thing of Jim Crow and, and also slavery. And I'm like, it's true. It's also how you code too. It's how you look, because you can be the exact same. You can, I've had biracial friends who are black and white that look mm -hmm. black and mm -hmm. some that look really, really white. Um, mm -hmm. They are ethnically the same, but mm -hmm. it depends mm -hmm. how you look. And I think um, for some who are like, oh, the Jamaica, Jamaican ancestors, they weren't oppressed. And I never realized there were so many Republicans and conservatives who were really really so invested in the black plight and how much black people have been oppressed but i'm like well how do you think how do you think black jamaicans like how do you think they got there it's, it's literally a boat and we're gonna drop some people off and then we're gonna keep going we're gonna drop people <laughs> yeah, off over yeah. there and over there. i was like it's really simple yeah, yeah but i do think that is true that we really have to um identify what we have to we have to respect everybody's mm -hmm. uh right to identify yeah themselves Wow. And and also like um you know what you like how some people who happen to be darker in the Indian community will some of, not not all of them some people will say I'm more Indian than you because of that mm. but um you know I've got a sister who has pale skin and light hair and she she's just as Indian as I am if if as Indian can even be a thing you know and that's why in the Only Good Indians 
I have Ricky's little brother be named Cheeto because he has orange hair and he is still <laughs> Indian. You know, it, it's not about phenotypical characteristics. It's about who you are, I think. Yes. And um, it's, it's funny because the more you talk about ethnicity and, and, and race, mm -hmm. the deeper you go into that dive, you just start to see how it's so surf surface, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about culturally, but originally everyone is from Africa. We were just, the further down mm -hmm. you go, to the mm -hmm. beginning, you just realize that it's just so, so much of it is like social, so much of it is constructed, mm -hmm. but there is something to it regarding culture, but it's mm -hmm. constructed at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, when, do you, in all of your work, do you, do you tend to write um, stories that centered around uh, Indians? Do you do that? Mm -hmm. I always feel, you know, when I say Indians, I know, mm -hmm. I know I was just saying, we got to call you what you want to be called. And every, I feel so like, mm, there's a thing that keeps going off. It's like, yeah, mm, yeah, don't yeah. say that. Um, so you can if, say if, it. If you hear my pause. <laughs> if native is more comfortable, say native. Native is always, it's always acceptable. You know? Maybe and, I'll I mean, say. Yeah. And I, I but, but, and not, not that anything's wrong with Indian, but I just feel like mm. from my outside perspective, I feel real mm. kind of like, I feel a little out of pocket <laughs> saying Indian mm. over mm. again. Mm -hmm. um but yeah do you feel like you, are all your stories centered around native characters uh, you know um for my purposes all the characters in my novels unless it's stated otherwise are generally blackfeet but i don't mm -hmm. feel like every story has to announce itself because it's almost like when you do that announcement and say this guy's blackfeet then you're writing for an audience that's not black feet and you're saying, look, this guy is weird. This guy's not like you, you know? And um, I think that's yeah. a weird, it's a weird tactic to take under the page, you know? So I think it's a much more effective strategy just to assume Indianness rather than to always have to explicitly state it, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. I know a lot of readers, um, I, I guess it depends on what the story is about too, because mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. readers automatically, not all, but a great majority, especially Caucasian readers, tend to just automatically code everybody as white, mm -hmm. unless it's stated otherwise. Mm -hmm. So then there is that balancing act where you're like, do you want to constantly state this person's ethnicity because they're not mm -hmm. white, but that does make it a thing. But if you don't say it, a lot of readers in their imagination will just paint everybody, you know, white, and that's just how they'll see yeah. them. Yeah. Um, and you know, you know, I've had people, oh. um, I've had people read my stories. And I might say in the first 10 pages of a 40 page story, I might, I might just mention way on the side that this guy's Blackfeet or this guy's native, this guy's Indian. And then I just keep on rolling. And the critique that I'll receive sometimes is mm -hmm. when it, when is this Indian is going to activate, you know, like it, at the, on page, on page 35, isn't he supposed to like turn his Indianness on and win the day or something. And it's, it's not a superpower, you know, it's, it's just a, it's an identity. It's not, you don't, you don't like pull off your shirt and be wearing a beaded vest and go to town on everybody, you know? <laughs> and you know, that's, I wanted to talk to you about that too, mm -hmm. because it's, it's funny because people as a, as a, as a writer, mm -hmm. you know, um, of color, right. And, and people tend to expect writers to write in their own identity, right. Mm -hmm. Or about their mm -hmm. own identity. Like tell me the such and such mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to, um, uh, uh, Zaina Adafat and she was saying, you know, she, she's she's palestinian and they were like where are the camels where's mm -hmm. the, the the hijabs like where's mm -hmm. the and she's like um that's not what the story is and mm -hmm. i was going to ask you like what what do you think what what are people's expectations regarding what they expect to see in your story it to be indian enough mm -hmm. or for you to like put the put the mm -hmm. you know indian on there what what you know, what I, is i think i think people want to come at Indian stories with the tools that they've been given they, that they've used before on other Indian stories. And that is, let's look at how it comes from the oral tradition. Let's look mm -hmm. how it deals with the, the politics of identity. Let's look how it deals with oppression. Let's, uh, let, let's look how it deals with racism. Let's look at how this culture is dragging this huge chain of history behind it. And um, but you're right, not every story has to wrangle with identity politics. Some stories are about trying to open a can of soup, you know, and you don't really question where is my place in the world as an Indian when you're trying to open a can of soup, you know? Mm hmm mm hmm Have you felt any pressures to do that um, from the editorial side? Uh, and no, not, you know, er, early in my career, I had some publishers 
figure out that my family's Indian name kept looking that that was my family's Indian name. And they were like, oh, man, we got to use this. Let's put this on the cover of a book. You can be Stephen Kaff looking instead of Stephen Jones. I grew up as Stephen Jones. I didn't grow up as Stephen Kaff looking. And they assured me that this is going to move some copies. It's going to sell some books. But mm -hmm. I didn't do it because that felt to me like, I guess it, I didn't do it for two reasons. I didn't do it because it felt like selling my identity, and, and you know, which is a weird transaction to, you know, to be part of. Yeah. But But also... I would never know if people were reading me for the exoticness or if mm. they're reading me because of the quality of the writing. And I want to be read for the quality of the writing. And I thought it's a much bigger coup if I can make it as a boring old Jones, you know? Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this book, I feel like this book is you definitely, this, I feel like this is one of the books every, every time I would open up um, one of those like, oh, what's this coming up next? Mm -hmm. Make sure you have to read, et cetera. Mm -hmm. This has shown up every <laughs> single time. And I'm not usually in like reading a lot. I don't read a lot of horror because mm -hmm. I have, a, I have an overactive imagination, mm -hmm. but I loved the premise and I loved that it was a horror novel, but really de dealing into some social commentary as well. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, when I read it, I could not put it down. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> so I wanted to know what mm -hmm. was, what was the kernel for this story? You know, I think um, I didn't realize this until I started answering questions at these book events, but I think the kernel for this is in 2007, uh, I was hunting elk on the reservation. I got a cow elk and this was November. Then probably four months later, maybe four and a half months later, surprise, I was moving from West Texas to Colorado and my, and I had like a, a space between leases. I had three months between leases. So I was going to be driving around seeing friends and family for two or three months. And I couldn't bring a chest full of um, that elk's meat with me. All the same, when I took that elk in the field, I had done what I do to all the animals that I take. I had told her that um, this is terrible. This feels wrong. But rest assured that we're going to use you. You're going to feed my family. That this isn't just for sport. This is for a good, like, circle, you know? Mm -hmm. And and then then she's in my freezer and I'm having to move and I can't take her with me. So I have to go up and down my street, giving away packets of elk meat to strangers, basically. And so the whole summer, driving around to family and friends, I kept wondering, are these people eating that elk meat? Or are they throwing it away? Did they not trust me? You know, because they knew I wrote horror, so they're not going to trust me. And I felt like, did I break my promise to that elk? And I, and I think that like festered inside me for 10 years. And then I finally wrote The Oregon Indians trying to deal with did I break that promise or not? Um, because I do think we have an ethical obligation to the animals we hunt, you know? I think we have an ethical obligation to all animals, really, but mm -hmm. espe especially the ones we hunt, you know? That is probably one of the best kernel stories I've ever heard. Someone was like, wow. This is also the, the book is so vivid. And man, yeah, that that is one of the best kernel stories I think I've ever heard. Um, Yes, because that's in, for, for those of you guys who may not, not have read the book yet, um, that's part of the story is that one of the characters that we meet, he's wondering about that. Um, if maybe that's part of why, the, it's exactly the same thing that you just said, why this is happening. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's funny because um, we do these little food delivery things and then we're not supposed to get any beef. We got some beef in there. And I was like, oh, and I don't eat beef anymore. I haven't eaten in a really long time. And I was like, we throw this out, but I felt bad about throwing it out. I've been trying to move actually to so be a little bit more vegan, but mm -hmm. I felt bad. And I was like, should I just eat it? I was like, I don't eat beef, but is it worse to eat the beef? Even though I don't eat beef anymore mm -hmm. for, for reasons, many reasons, mm -hmm. or throw it away. And I'm like, that doesn't seem right to me. Like it died for nothing. Although this is just a small portion, but just that didn't sit right. Yeah, That's an yeah. amazing kernel story. Um, I loved now, you, you know, things happen. It's a horror novel, you guys. It's, mm -hmm. it's hor horrific and it's gory. Um, so there's two women in the story. Mm -hmm. And they get, they get, they get, they, they are, um, they, they, what happens to them is what happens to people mm -hmm. in horror stories. Mm -hmm. Janie mm -hmm. and Peter, they suffer horrific deaths. At first I was like, come on, like, why do the women, mm -hmm. I kind of felt like they got it worse than the guys who actually mm -hmm. did the thing. Mm -hmm. But I was like, uh, but, the, but actually in the story, women tend to be the strongest characters, um, mm -hmm. especially one of the, one of the daughters that we'll, we'll get to. Um, how do you balance out one, 
um, because I listened to your acknowledgments as well. I was reading and listening to the audio book, bouncing between. And um, I I listened to your acknowledgments and I was really glad that you read read them yourself. And you said how you just, you you want the women to live. You want Indian women to live and their women are strong. And um, how do you balance out violence against people in general and the horror, but really how women are handled in your stories with obviously it's a horror novel. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good question. You're right. It's being a horror novel. Most of these people are not going to make it. You know, everybody's going to meet a bad end. There, nobody like um, passes away in their sleep, and everybody's like, "Oh, what a nice <laughs> death he had." You know, not, nothing like that. It's it's terrible for everyone. Um, if they do pass in their sleep, it's because Freddy Krueger came to get them. You know, but um, the <laughs> trick is, if you um, if you protect someone and let them have an off-page death, or you let them survive when no one else is surviving basically then it becomes um like i do want to do i want to do positive not i don't know about positive representation representation i want to do accurate representation and even-handed representation you know but um part of that is that um how to say this you know um to to go off to the side a little bit i'm a big proponent that um in indian literature in american indian literature we need more indian bad guys because if Indians are only the good guys, that's just like essentialism on the other side. You know, it's saying all Indians are good. And I think for Indian fiction, Indian literature to be properly real, I guess, we need the whole spectrum. We need good guys, bad guys, people in the middle, you know? Mm -hmm. In the the same way, um, my characters, yes, I want to do accurate, even-handed, fair representation. It is a horror novel. Most of them are going to die. But (laughs) what that means is if I do curry one of them safely to the end Mm -hmm. and or give them a softer death death than everybody else, then that's like doing that thing where all your Indians are good guys. You know, it's saying it's like the protection becomes its own damaging thing. You know, it's like saying that this person is so fragile that I had to hand deliver them through the story. And that's just as insulting as anything else. I feel like, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, but, phone but calls the, during- Even, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's a reminder. I can't believe I got a reminder. Yeah. I'm totally yeah. kidding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, you're right. And I think, I think part of that comes from not having enough representation, whether mm-hmm. it's Native Americans, whether it's Black people, whether it's <clears throat> you know Koreans, um, any group that doesn't that doesn't get enough representation in fiction, you almost feel like each time, each character, each story has to carry the weight of representing everyone. Mm-hmm. And so it has to be perfect. It has yeah. to be, can't, you, mm-hmm. you want to be able to have the luxury of having terrible characters that mm-hmm. represent that, of that group that don't represent the group. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, sure. maybe we'll see more when we see more, um, more native literature pushed to the forefront and, and push mm-hmm. be able to get be given the same platform do you feel like there's been a um a big surge or at least not a surge of more i'm sure there's been plenty of natives mm-hmm. right but publishing opening its doors and 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 less um i guess less keeping because people you know publishing is very white and sometimes mm-hmm. people are, are are not uh able to be able to push through their stories, even though they may be amazing stories. Do you feel like these things are changing or? You know, I think, um, yeah, there are more doors opening, but it's not because the industry is opening them necessarily. I think it's because we're kicking them down, you know? And I think that's the way to do it. Um, The trick is if you wait for an invitation, it's never going to come. You just got to jump to the market yourself and do good enough work that people can't ignore it. And once you start doing that, and once you start delivering stories that are gripping and entertaining and challenging that don't necessarily fulfill the expectations that the market or the reader is expecting like um, oral tradition or identity politics or any of that stuff if they realize that this is just a person telling a good story that's the best kind of thing we can do it's not about um, losing the tragic narrative and appropriating the comic narrative it's not about only presenting indians in a good light rather than a unfavorable light it's about um, just convincing people that we still exist, that we're people, because we're not supposed to exist in America anymore. So many people are surprised. They're like, oh, they're still Indians? I'm like, yeah, well, there's, seven oh, million, there's seven million of us, you know, and we don't all live in teepees, you know, maybe maybe some of us do, and that's great, but um, we're supposed to just be, as Louise Erdrich says, um, falling off the back of a horse dead, you know, in a John Wayne movie. That, that's the 
version of us that America likes to engage. Either that or commodified on a t-shirt, you know, like Geronimo or something, or having or naming a naming a truck after us. You know, that's supposed to be an honoring thing, I guess. I don't know. I think it's stealing really. But um mm-hmm. but yeah, it's it's just it's just about doing it well and not asking for permission. Not asking for permission. I love that. Um it's funny because there were so many things that I was thinking when it comes to everything that you're saying right now. And it reminds me of um, an interview you did with a gentleman at a bookstore. And mm-hmm. and it, it was not offensive what he said at all. Mm-hmm. But when you're talking about that, not wanting to just only have like the good Indian, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but he was just saying, well, you know, there's stereotype. I mean, well, it's, it's well, he didn't say stereotype. He was saying, um, it was a Caucasian gentleman. And he was just me, I guess he meant it as a compliment, but he was just like, well, you know, when people think of Native Americans and Indians, you know, they, mm-hmm. no matter what, you're going to get stoic and, you know, mm-hmm. and wise and, you know, calm. Mm-hmm. And, so, and I'm like, yeah, but that's also a stereotype. Like, mm-hmm. everyone is not like, if you have a question about what to do, you're going to find the herbal recipe if you ask a Native American. Or like, yeah, yeah. no matter what happens, that Native American is going to be like, this is what we should do. I was like, that's a stereotype too. It's like super yeah. smart Chinese kid. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's still a stereotype and it still puts you in a box. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it'll be amazing when you have so many stories, like so many native stories, so many native writers who are in mainstream publishing that it's not even a thing, mm-hmm. you know? Oh no, I, that, that's what I'm waiting for, for sure. And you're right, that it, that is happening. Like, um, let's see. Um, we just have a book coming out, Winter Counts, by David Heska Wyden. Um, and we just had Darcy Little Badger. She did a Lazzo. Rebecca Runhorse has Black Sun coming out. And she's been dominating the, the market and with other books, too, which are really good. Um, Erica Wirth is writing wonderful stuff. Lady Long Soldier is doing amazing poetry. There's, um, it's not like a quorum has been reached. It's like the, but there's just so many, of, so many of us pushing on the outer wall of the industry. But that wall is toppling over, I think. When it, when it comes to writing, do you stick to to horror stories? Um, do yeah. you like? Do you see everything through a scary lens? Because I was telling mm-hmm. everybody in our in our um, in our WhatsApp, everybody catch up with us. Our, our, our first video, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you're writing not your writing cave because I don't know. If, some people have like they're like they're writing de- den, but it just feels mm-hmm. like it felt like a writing cave. That's what it felt like. When people say that, but it'll be bright. Mm-hmm. It really was like you had pictures everywhere, mm. books, quotes. Mm. It looked like that would be a place where you write scary <laughs> stories. Yeah, no, I mean, horror is what I'm into. So horror is what I kind of surround myself with. But to tell you the truth, um, oftentimes when I sit down to write a story, I'm just looking to write a little Chekhov story about a, a guy looking out a window at a beach and falling in love with a woman walking a dog, you know? that those kind of distant, soft, muted, quiet stories. Mm-hmm. But then I get bored about three pages in and, you know, here comes a werewolf and it chops somebody's head off. And I'm like, well, that's <laughs> exciting. I'm going to follow that werewolf, you know? And, and so I think I just have that kind of imagination that always wants to swing a machete, you know? And like Stephen King says, when people ask him, why do you write horror? He'll often say, some of us are just wired that way. And I think I'm just wired that way. Yeah, no, I mean, I was, when I was reading it, especially when go back to the, the goriness, um, I was like, I'm reading this, and this is like, oh, I'm like, he's got to write it, sit there in the dark writing this thing. I was like, and and seeing it, I was like, oh, how does he do that? Because there is, okay, well, there's the violence with the women, but there's a lot of violence with, and just FYI, you guys, there's animal violence. I normally don't do trigger warnings. I know I'm in the minority, but I don't like to give trigger warnings. I don't, I'm like, come on, no. You're reading a story, things are going to happen. But mm-hmm. it was just so <laughs> gory with the dogs. Mm-hmm. I was like, and with the elk. Mm-hmm. We'll get to that in a second. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, whoo. But I'm sure you've gotten people who are like, why did you do that to the animal? Mm-hmm. Well, why do you think people are so triggered? Um, mm-hmm. Worse when it comes to animal violence, even, even compared to like the human violence. Why is it the animal mm-hmm. violence? everybody you know yeah uh, you know, the first let me say that um there's truck violence too which really hurts my heart i hate to see trucks get hurt you know and there's <laughs> a truck there's some trucks in here that take some dents you know and that makes me quite sad but um i think people get all misty-eyed about dogs dying whereas they won't get so misty-eyed about a person dying because at some level we think oh that's a person he's 30 years old 
he's probably asking for it in some fashion. You know, he did something to deserve that. Whereas a dog, even if that dog's 12 years old, was old for a dog, we still think that's a good dog. You know, that dog didn't do anything to deserve this kind of end. That dog was just trotting along, having a happy life, trying to be a good friend to whoever it lives with, you know? And so I think there is the idea that dogs um, are in a constant state of innocence, never mind that they chew your socks up and stuff like that. You know, I don't know if that really counts against their soul or anything. But. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, uh, that makes sense to me. The whole thing with people getting it, like, when you, so when you're writing your stories, do you feel like, you know, so I feel like there's a fail safe that people put in there sometimes, like at least mm -hmm. in movies. Speaking of which, someone mentioned, um, they were like, I think it was in the book corner, in the book corners uh, comment, and she said, this needs to be a movie. I totally mm -hmm. agree. Mm -hmm. Has, have, have you sold the rights to this or, cause I, this could totally be a movie. Yeah. Um, it has, it has been option, but I'm not supposed to say anything other than that or people gotcha. will come down, come down on me. Yeah. So, got it. so possible movie in the works. Um, I totally, I totally see that. Mm -hmm. Um, do you put those little fail safes in there? Meaning, well, with PETA, I didn't really see that. Mm -hmm. um, but generally in your stories, e even Shaney, you know, there's always some, there is a thing where it's like, well, you know, that person did this thing or they said that mm -hmm. terrible thing or that, they pushed mm -hmm. that kid down, you know, they're going to get it in the horror mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. Do you tend to do that? Or mm -hmm. sometimes do people just have, they're just great and then it happens. Generally, like, um, I think horror stories are built on our idea of cycles of justice, which is to say, if you do something wrong, then you've made, you've submitted yourself to a cycle of justice and it's going to come back. I mean, if you kick a turtle, then maybe 20 pages later, a snake bites you. And that, that's a cycle of justice coming around, you know? Um, it's not like the turtle and the snake are friends. It's more about a big, it's the world is a fair place. And the world is going to rebalance the scales of justice, you know? So, yes, I do think that in, in my fiction anyways, that does tend to be the way things work. However, you're completely right that it is sometimes good to, lead the reader into thinking oh well this person's pretty good and then to just take that person out and because that blindsides them you know and i think yeah. the more the more you can blindside the reader in a story such that they can't see how the story can keep going on anymore after this point the mm -hmm. better a read the better a reading experience they're going to have because because the road that denora took um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what was going to happen mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. what happened to the dogs mm -hmm. and what, what was going on with the guys that was kind of like you did do something but I don't know if you know it was kind of rough what happened but at the same mm -hmm. time Pete, Pita and 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 Shaney I was thinking I really don't know what's going to happen with Denora I can see something going and I'm not going to tell you guys but I'm just saying it anything could happen mm -hmm. um, but the ending mm -hmm. I needed that oh thank you so, so thank much Thanks. I needed just going through what I went through. You guys mm -hmm. want to tell you, it was, it was, it was, it was a lot. Emotionally, mm -hmm. it was a lot. I needed that ending. I needed that to happen. Like I almost cried. I don't cry when I read books. I just mm -hmm. get a little teary. I needed that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back to a justice thing. So don't let me forget that mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about justice. But did you know that, did you already have in mind the ending? Were you writing this oh. and exploring? Or did you know that would happen? I had no idea that was going to happen. Really, I didn't know I was writing a novel. Uh, when I was working through the first part, initially, it didn't start with Ricky. It started with Lewis up on that ladder, looking through that the, the blades of that fan. I was just writing something that finally got long enough that I thought, hey, this is a novella. And then I got to the very last line of the novella, and I wrote that last line, and I thought, hey, that works. I can't believe that works. Because I'm always surprised when things work out, and they they're not they don't want to work out, you know. So I'm, I feel lucky when it does. But then I then like another line presented itself right beside that line that could replace that first ending line, and I realized that line opens it up into a novel. And so I texted my agent and I asked her, "Hey, do you want me to write a novella or a novel this time?" And she said, "Write a novel. That'll be more fun." So I turned it into a novel, and then I just kept chasing it. And I already had some characters and some stories, so it was no big deal. It, it was kind of like built in, it felt like. And I think, if I remember correctly, my suspicion of how it was going to end was that um, Denny, the game warden, was going to save the day. But mm -hmm. then I got the then I got to the end, and I, I realized that ain't no good. You know, that, that's not a that doesn't work. Um, and I, that's how nearly all of my endings are. I always have one ending like dimly planned, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But then I get there and I realize that's not nearly enough. I have to do something more. And what I realized with the only good Indians was I love the slasher. I love the idea that 
some group of people commit a prank, a trespass, a crime, and then 10 years later, 20 years later, that spirit of vengeance comes back to get them, Jason Voorhees mm-hmm. or, or whoever. I love that build, and I love the the final girl who stands up to that slasher. However, mm-hmm. my issue with the final girl is always that in order to win the day, she has to basically become a dude, you know? She has to – it becomes a matter of who has the muscles to swing this machete the hardest, and so it feels like she's cashing in her identity to win the day, and that to me is a loss while it's also a win. And I, 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 I was, I started considering what if the final girl could win the day with some of the tools or muscles that she has been using her whole life to get by. Then she doesn't have to trade in who she is. And that, to me, kind of resonated and felt like the good way to open this story up at the end. And it definitely, both on both sides, that happened. Mm-hmm. I felt like there was a moment of empathy and understanding and heart. Mm-hmm on both ends and I needed that. I'm t- when I tell you I needed that as a mom, <laughs> I needed that because as a mom, the other mm-hmm. thing that happened, I was like, no, no, mm-hmm. ah, and I needed that. Mm-hmm. I needed yeah. it. Um, okay, I needed that. Um, and speaking of Denny, um, I, I, I'm like, I don't know if I missed something, but I'm like, mm-hmm. wait, couldn't he, I wrote this down, couldn't he have just let the guys pay the fine, but still keep mm-hmm. the meat. And I know he gave them those options, yeah. but why yeah. couldn't he pay the fine and keep the meat so the meat wouldn't get wasted? So wasn't some of this on him? Well, um, no, I mean, the, in the first case, these dudes don't have the money to pay the fine for nine elk plus whichever ones ran off and died. But even if they had the money, I think if he lets them pay and keep that meat, then they return to town back to Browning as champions, as um, their version of tribal heroes. And and he knows they did something highly unethical. And so to see them returning in like a little make do parade, you know, of we're the meat bringers, we're, the, we're, we're gonna give you some, some, some meat, everybody's gonna get a little bit. Then that is to, to me, or my conception of Denny is that that would seem horribly unfair to him. It would be undermining everything he believes in. Right, that is true. That, yes, I can see that. Mm-hmm. Although I was like, Denny, this is on you, but I, I can see that. <laughs> I can see that. I can see that. And then there would be no justice. Yeah. Right. Um, it's so interesting because I think there's a lot of these things that we don't, that, that we don't know. Um, if you're not someone who's native, if you're not someone who grew up on a reservation or Jason or anything like that, mm-hmm. you will be clueless to this. Um, what do you think that a lot of Americans, besides the fact that, like you said, a lot of Americans are like, oh my goodness, Native mm-hmm. Americans are still here, you know? Um, what do you, what do you feel like is a big, um, misunderstanding when it comes to what life is like growing up native modern because that's the thing that you really deal with too is what Mm -hmm. it is to be native in the modern world right Mm -hmm. Uh, and not what we see in movies or we learn in the history books what what do you need to know and what don't we understand about growing up on a reservation for instance um you know a lot of people that i've seen who aren't indian who go to reservations they ask the question um why is why are there Dr. Pepper cans all along the fence? Um, I'll on my screen try to go dark there. Why why was why why is this place kind of junked up? You know, um, aren't y'all supposed to be like elves? Don't you aren't you the spirits of the forest? Don't you steward this and keep it all right? You know, which is ridiculous because America just wants us to be elves so it can pretend that we're fantasy creatures and they don't exist. You know, but um, and so number one, I think sometimes you'll see trash against the fence on the reservation because we are resisting that stereotype of an Indian who cries about litter in the creek or something. But mm-hmm. also, I think what people don't realize, um, or they don't consciously realize anyways, is that um, the reservations have been chiseled out. They're like um, 1 40th of our, used to be our territory, our hunting grounds, you know, our ceremonial grounds, whatever it is. And so by sometimes junking that place up it's like us commenting on the fact that this is where you banished us this is not where we selected you know and like the blackfeet we're we're probably kind of lucky because our reservation is part of what used to be our land a a lot of nations got transplanted across the country and thrown Mm. somewhere that was not home to them and i cannot even imagine what that must have been like you know but i think that's that's one big misconception and i mean there's a whole stack of misconceptions like we get free college um 
and that we're freeloaders and it's not that and 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 none of that's true i mean every culture is going to have freeloaders don't get me wrong we're not vulnerable to that of course we'll we'll mooch a dinner if we can like anybody <laughs> but um but um um yeah like yeah people just think that the things that we're getting like um any annual payments from a settlement or something are gifts rather than either the result of um, litigation or treaty specific rights, you know, and it's, it's, it's stuff that we're entitled to, not that we're gifted and it's not that much stuff either, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's what happens. I, th I think people forget about the history of the country. Mm -hmm. And so they feel like these are things that are given and um, mm -hmm. extra versus things that are owed mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. Um, someone was asking me about, it was a question that I was going to ask you too, um, mm -hmm. about the, uh, the Washington, uh, I think it, I forgot what it's called, Washington football team now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Washington football mm -hmm. team. And they haven't found a permanent name yet. How do you feel yeah. about that? Name? Um, oh, um, and as, um, like, there was some land, I guess, yeah. given back the treaty yeah. specific, what you were about to, uh, to people in Oklahoma, I think it was, yeah. right? And also one of the pipelines just got like, it, it didn't have access to tribal lands like it wanted. Um, no, I think that's wonderful. I think that's the important stuff actually. Um, well, I think the, the land um, settlement in Oklahoma is super important. Um, a land base is so important to be a sovereign people, you know? <laughs> and um, as for the Redskins name, yeah, that's always been the most insulting name. I've, I, I've, it's always just stymied me how that can be in circulation at all and be remotely all right. But at the same time, I think when America, like, I feel like America just in a dull instinct, not like consciously, tries to distract us with issues of representation so that we won't mess with issues of sovereignty. Sovereignty is the stuff that actually matters. It doesn't matter whether Andre 3000 is wearing a headdress at the Grammys. That's not going to change the world. You know, it might be insulting. It is insulting. But mm -hmm. um, winning sovereignty cases, getting more sovereignty and using that sovereignty in ways that help us and help other nations, other tribes, that's the actual important stuff, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, 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 I was I was told like from the time I was a little bitty I was not to call um the Blackfeet a tribe I was I was to call us a nation because nations deal as nations with uh, with America with France with uh, all the other places tribes can be subjugated nations deal with power and so I was always taught that we're a nation that's yeah that's interesting I didn't, I didn't know from that angle I remember um in school too, it was like the word tribes was kind of like, mm, do we really want to use that mm -hmm. for different groups of people, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't know, I didn't think about it from that point of view. And I think that is important. Um, how do you, how, how when, when kids are on the reservation, how is that with like learning history? Because it's, it's really, it can be really messed up depending on where you are, mm -hmm. which are, you almost have to like learn on your own, you yeah. know what I mean, yeah. history. But what, what was the angle um, regarding how Thanksgiving was handled, all of those things. What was the angle? Um, you know, um, I should I should probably preface this by saying I did not grow up in the reservation. I grew up in West Texas, oh. far far from the Blackfeet Reservation. I mean, I'm in Texas. The reservation's in Montana. I would mm -hmm. go there a lot growing up, but I never went to school there, so I'm not actually I can't speak with any kind of confidence about the curriculum. Um, I do know that, or I do suspect, anyways, that the same way I was told history wasn't from the textbooks it was from my parents my uncles my grandparents telling me um that's bs that's bs this is the way it really <laughs> was you know and um i suspect that, that that's a big part of it actually that you learn early on that the history books the state history books that you're being walked through that are number one 30 years old and number yeah. but number number two they're kind of actively repressing the truth you know in order to promote uh mm -hmm an identity that's kind of scot-free that doesn't have any bad things associated with it you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i love that your parents sat you down and kind of had to explain that too to mm -hmm. you instead of letting it go um yeah. and you do cover a lot of parenthood in the story which was mm -hmm. what i love um the relationship between gabe and denora is not perfect mm -hmm. obviously um but at the same time you feel the love, you feel the pride that he has, even though, you know, he acts up and has to get out of the games and stuff, you feel that mm -hmm. pride. What, what were you discussing? Uh, what did you want to talk about with, with you know, I had, 
I had a lot of friends who um, ended up um, having children in high school or just right out of high school, which is, um, I mean, my mom had me when she was like 16, I guess. And so I'm, I'm a product of that as well. But, um, and, and it's not inherently bad. You kind of, when you have a kid young, you grow up with your kid, you know, and it's, it's, it can be really wonderful. I think I loved growing up with my mom, you know, she, like when I was, when I was 15, she was 30, 31, you know, no, that, that's a different kind uh -huh. of build. That's a different kind of build, you know? Um, but with Gabe and Denora, I was kind of just looking into, um, how Gabe initially was not a good father. He was still running around, you know, but mm -hmm. as he matured and he realized what's important to him in the world and he's trying to, he's not really trying to be a better person. He's trying to repair his relationship with Denora. And I, I've seen that happen a lot of times with um, friends, with people. And I think it's, yes, people have done stuff like um, parents have done stuff to hurt you. I mean, um, not like physical harm, but like just to um, not be there for you, like when you're five years old or something. But if that parent comes around again, when you're 20, you're both different people. And I mean, what does it hurt to give somebody a chance, I think, you know, and consider that something good can come from this, you know? Yeah, because it seemed like she learned a lot from him. And the thing mm -hmm. that, the thing, even if he wasn't um, the best dad, the mm -hmm. thing he really needed, he, it was like one of the biggest things that he was trying to give her, mm -hmm. um, pride, and not making mm -hmm. her small. Yeah. Um, which it would be so helpful as, as a female, but also, mm -hmm. you know, as black feet and mm -hmm. not sure self yeah. to make other people comfortable. And I love yeah. that. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's kind of like in my estimate or in my read of it, it's like he sees his own, like um, his own could have been in her, you know, I think that's a, a lot of parents are like that. They, they want, they don't necessarily want their kid to be everything they couldn't, but they see the potential that the kid can realize that they never quite achieved, you know? And mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think Gabe sees that in Denora. He sees that his own recklessness and need to show off has only gotten him in trouble, but because she can dribble the ball and shoot the ball, she can use that, you know? Yeah. Um, that, it was really poignant too when, when she was going to the games and the things mm. that they would say in the audience, mm. all those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it reminded me when I, I lived, used to live in Alaska for a little while and I went to high mm. school in Alaska, the Bar Barrow we played and like the whole team, I think, it was mostly Elliot's when we were there. Mm -hmm. um, it was like the, the barrel, for those of you guys who don't, don't know, is like the top, it's almost like right outside of the North Pole. Mm -hmm. And um, you just, you, you hear the stereotypes, you know, growing up, mm -hmm. you, you hear all that stuff. Um, and you don't realize how much of that stuff is like internalized. So the things that they're shouting yeah. um, at, the, at the games, which is like unbelievable at the same time, you totally can believe it. But the things that we have in our everyday language, like, oh, you need to just bury the hatchet. You know, mm -hmm. or let's mm -hmm. have a powwow about this. Or we yeah. got a certain wagons, like all of these. Yeah. America's so racist. <laughs> it's like, even nursery songs, we have to like. Yeah. I was telling my husband, like, how many nursery songs were have racist history <laughs> and they changed the words. Mm -hmm. Or even things like 10 Little Indians, like, mm -hmm. come on Spotify. And we're like, mm -hmm. I was like, something about this song is not right. Mm -hmm. I know it's just mm -hmm. one little, two, little, three, little Indians. But mm -hmm. I was like, it's almost like you see them counting the 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 little boys as if they're things and not people yeah. yeah yeah and it's just so prevalent um when when you talk about uh when you like exploring denora and and mm -hmm. we're talking about what you're growing up with just as far as like knowing the history books and everything mm -hmm. when you're looking at modern today living today um what do you think are some of the really important things that are important for native youth to know um not even just the youths actually just mm -hmm everyone in you what know, it is to balance modern life yeah. with it's, traditional thing i think if i could like you know tell everybody everything or put it on a bumper sticker i guess it really has to do with the title this backwards title you know <laughs> the backwards title on the screen that um don't let other people tell you what it is to be a good indian you know because you'll get, you'll get a conflicting definition. You'll, if you gather all the definitions, they'll all be in conflict. You know, some people will say it's about. Sorry, I, my, my, my phone wants to die, but I won't, I'll try not to let it. Um, some people will say it's about um, getting this much education. I mean, everybody will say different things, but 
-hmm. you, you, you have to be careful about internalizing that. You have to set out your own like threshold for success, I think. And if, if there is a key to happiness, I mean, I'm, I'm what, 48 years old, so I surely don't have everything figured out. But the one thing I feel like I'm getting a glimmer of is that you set your own um, markers for success, you know, and so that'd be what I would tell anybody really, not just, not just Indian kids, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's amazing how you balanced out the social commentary. Mm -hmm. Like you cover so much in the story, even when it comes to just what it is to maintain tradition, trying to run from tradition. Can you run, can you run from your roots really? Mm -hmm. Right. And the social commentary that's there. Um, how do you balance that out with just straight up plot? Yeah. You know, uh, keeping the pages turning, characterization, all of those things, because you cover such heavy topics, and you have also have horror. You're doing a lot. How do you balance it all? Wow, I got nervous there. There were be bees all over my face. That was <laughs> weird. <huh>? <laughs> <laughs> um, 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 you know, it, for me, it's not about, like, uh, you do have to balance the pacing and the horror elements. You can't stack all your horror, horror elements in the first 25% and then have a lot of boring stuff for the rest of the book. You've got to pace it out, of course. But as for the social commentary, I don't ever think, oh, I want to do some of that here. I want to do some of that there. I just, um, I am who I am and I rail against the things I rail against. I have my own angers and grievances and things I want to write. And because those are such a part of who I am, they always find their way to the page, I think. But I never, I never feel like I better build a scene around this or that, you know, like with, like that you were talking about Denora talking about the spirit ribbons that say massacre the Indians and Indian go home and all that stuff. Those are just yeah. all, that's just all stuff I've seen and I'm tired of seeing, you know, so I wanted to call it out a little bit and I wanted to have a really strong character call it out. And I, I don't, I mean, I don't really have the illusion that I can do away with it, but um, maybe I can push it back a little bit, you know? I mean, there's so many, but see, there are so many things as a writer, mm -hmm. you have the power to bring attention to so many things that mm -hmm. we don't know, you know what I mean? And so I say we, I mean people who are not Native, yeah. that well, are just have no idea. Like someone in the comments said, hey, I didn't even realize, I never listened to the, the Indian song that way. Mm -hmm. For me, it was like, yeah, really thinking about, you know, you think reservations and you think of it in a very peripheral way, but mm -hmm. really like thinking about what that is to grow up on a reservation, what's what's the overall energy what's the vibe what it is to, to leave the reservation mm -hmm. and to, um and even things like when people say that person's off the reservation you know what i mean mm -hmm. like, they're, they're, like all of these things that are so so american mm -hmm. um so i think you do a great job of bringing a bring awareness to all of this and for us to understand and have empathy and understanding someone else's point of view which i think would have made it so the washington uh, football team would have changed their name a lot sooner is if people could understand and have empathy for someone who's not themselves and be able to be in someone else's shoes and i think that's what art does so in that in that you've done a lot well thank you yeah i mean that's what i mean for artists are supposed to call out the bad stuff you know that's why plato didn't want any poets in his republic you know because we're gadflies we we mess things up ideally you know i'm um, ideally we we um, offer critiques of the way things are, but we wrap that in an entertainment. And that's the hard thing to remember, that it's got to be entertaining first. And if it's entertaining, then you can smuggle the other stuff in, you know? Yes. It's like music and music lyrics. Like mm -hmm. you, you can you can have the, you can say everything that you want to say in a song, but mm -hmm. you got, that beat's got to be right. That song has to be really, yeah. it has to be before people can listen to, to get the message of what they're saying. Yep. So before we, we leave, I would love for, Oh, um, someone, Kino, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing Kino Sherry. Um, what's your thoughts on five, hashtag $5 Indians and those who try to benefit from the little resources given by the government? You know, I don't know that hashtag $5 Indians. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it refers to. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Kay. Um, I didn't know that one either, so I won't be able to be mm -hmm. any help. I do want to ask though, um, too, before you go, if you could just share a couple of writerly things with us. Yeah. Um, well, we talked about that. Your, your writing routine. That's what I wanted to know, too. Mm -hmm. um, what might your writing routine be? If you even have a writing routine, you definitely mm -hmm. have a writing space. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I hear other writers talk and they say, I'll wake up at six. I have some coffee. I'm at the keyboard by 630. I write till 11. Then I eat some lunch and I do errands the rest of the day or whatever it is, you know. And 
I always think, wow, when I grow up, I'm going to be that kind of writer, you know, but um, it's getting a little late for me to grow up. I think I've never, I, I've always write, written in stolen moments. I mean, I've got kids, I've got jobs, I've got trucks breaking down. I've got a house full of dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got, um, I want to rewatch 30 Rock for some ridiculous reason. I've got ridiculous. Oh, you know, I, I, I love 30 Rock. <laughs> I and I have just all, all kinds of all kinds of stuff life you know it's just life yeah. and um and which is to say life does not funnel you to your keyboard you've got to like wait and pull against it to get to your keyboard you've got to choose writing and yeah. even when you choose it sometimes you have to string together a writing day from 12 minutes here 28 minutes there 45 minutes there and that's all I do I I I have playlists I associate with every novel such that I can put my earbuds in and immediately be in the emotional space of that novel. So I don't have to do a warm up period so I can use my 12 minutes a whole lot better. And that's how I write. I write in stolen moments. I found that when I dedicate a period of weeks or whatever to only writing, that I just um, ride my bike and watch Rockford Files. I don't do anything productive, you know? But yeah. I need the moments to kind of get in there. Yeah, I need I need to be stealing time. I need to feel guilty about not picking people up at the airport, and that makes me write better because I think this has got to be this has better be worth it if they're going to be mad at me. You know? Yeah, no, no, I get it. Like I, I have to be in the zone. I have to get in the zone. But I've have mm-hmm. I've have written in, in moments as well too. Mm-hmm. Although I don't prefer that. I get very grouchy um, mm-hmm. if I'm not writing. I get mm-hmm. grouchy. Um, are you willing to share anything or able to share? We know we said that the 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 the, the rights have been sold, but can't mm-hmm. talk about it. Mm-hmm. but is there anything that you're working on right now that you can give us a tidbit on a sneak peek yeah on? i've got a novel coming out next summer that's another slasher and wow. Already? This one, yeah yeah and um i think i might have one out before that too how but i'm, I'm probably not novel this size how many words was this about? uh probably 70 or 80 i would guess 70 or 80, 70 or 80 000, i would suspect but man i have Maybe it took me four weeks. Generally, novels take me four to six weeks to write. Um, but uh, but I have one. Well, I have one coming out next summer, which is a slasher that's probably about twice the size. You know, it's a it's a big old thing, um, and uh, I like it a whole lot. It's um, not on the reservation. It it's set in Idaho. Maybe I can. That's all I can say that it's in Idaho. Idaho. Okay, I love that. Your past too. Wow. I'm I'm still like I'm still on that. Like the fact that you're like walk like you can write six to eight weeks the whole or four weeks. You said. <laughs> um, also, is there anything that you're reading that you would love to recommend to us? You know, I just I just now read finished. It was either last night or this morning. Um, Carmen um, um, Mikado's Low Low Woods. The six, uh, the six episodes for ID. No, it's for DC. It's for Joe Hill's imprint. And um, that story completely blew me away. I could not have been more impressed. It What's just, it called? Um, it's called the Lolo Woods. The Lolo Woods. Yeah. Okay. And it, the story is just so good. And it's doing exactly what I'm talking about. It's, um, I mean, I don't want to give away any of its secrets. Everyone should read it and experience it. But it's got important stuff to say, but it's wrapped in such an attractive, entertaining wrapper. Yeah. Love that. Thank you for that recommendation. And thank you for chatting with us, for joining us. Someone said you're very handsome. Someone was also saying you had a nice smile. I wasn't going to hit you with all of that. because I was like... <laughs> yeah. And thank you so much for, 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 for writing this. Um, it really opened my eyes to a lot and gave me a lot of insight into things I didn't even, you know, know, think of that or things that I thought about before, but just, just, knew too much from a distance. Um, and I think it was really, it's like, I always keep saying it's like a social commentary is the horror it's entertaining, but it's, it's more than that as well, which, which I love in a book myself. Thank and thank, thank you guys. If you guys haven't, thank you guys for joining us. Um, if you haven't read this already, it's not too late to, I want to say swipe up, but <laughs> to order this, um, to borrow it from your library, order the ebook it's amazing hopefully this this conversation gave you a lot of insight and will make you look forward to reading the book even more and if you've already read it revisit um thank you so much for your time man i i I loved our conversation and yeah just appreciate you well thank you it was wonderful talking to you and i should add that the the audio book of this is read by a blackfeet guy it's the first one of my novels has been done by another blackfeet which is really cool wow 
that is really cool and it's a great audio book as well like i said mm -hmm. i was reading and then when you know I was, I was driving and stuff like that i was also listening to it as well which it was mm -hmm. a really good experience and i love that you, you acknowledgements at the end well thank you thank you so thank you so much thanks guys for joining thank you. us and can't wait to read the rest of your work thank you thank you bye, bye. bye.